Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, this webinar is going to be on safe recruitment. So safe recruitment is about ensuring that safeguarding measures are integrated into every step of recruitment and personal management cycle. Organizations need to hire the right people. The right people are those that have skills for the job, but they also need to commit to the organization's values are able to abide by the organization's safeguarding policy and the code of conduct and demonstrate that they are free of criminal convictions or safeguarding misconduct in previous employment. So majorly this webinar is going to focus on safeguarding measures that are needed during recruitment and address some of the challenges that organizations might face in ensuring their recruitment practices are safe. My name is Caroline Kibos, and I am the National Associate of the South Sudan Hub. Next slide, Noel. So the South Sudan Hub, or the RSH in general, aims to support organizations, especially in the aid sector, to strengthen their safeguarding policies and practices against uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. So our major focus is on the small local organizations in developing countries. And that's why we see the hub is being implemented in Africa, in three countries, that's in South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And recently in the Middle East, uh, in Jordan, Yemen, and Syria. You can navigate to the South Sudan hub page which is a uh, HTTPS South Sudan safeguarding support hub .org for you to, to go through our tools and resources, news and events. With me today, we'll have two panelists. One from South Sudan, Gaspar Amulewani, a South Sudanese licensed advocate and consultant. He's a senior researcher with extensive experience in legal research monitoring and evaluation, surveys, training, policy and legal analysis and development of organizational operating policies and procedures. He's currently working with the South Sudan Law Society. Before joining the South Sudan Law Society, Gaspar served as the executive director of the South Sudan Women Lawyers Association between 2014 and 2015. Gaspar, you're welcome. Thank you, Caroline, for having me. Oh, and thank you for all the members that joined us in this important webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to present on this important topic of uh, safe recruitment uh, as an important component of safeguarding. And I consider safeguarding as a human rights protection issue that every organization has an obligation to ensure that uh, employees are carefully selected and inducted to safeguard within the context of the organization to avoid uh, sexual exploitation, abuses, and harassment. So safe recruitment is really at the primary stage where you start the safeguarding processes. Because once you have bad employees on board, you really have problem uh, keeping into the standards of safeguarding. So it requires that employees or employers basically have to uh, ensure a thorough process of recruiting staffs uh, throughout the steps of the recruitment that we'll see uh, earlier to highlight their safeguarding obligations and ensure that they recruit on board staff that have a good record in terms of avoiding sexual exploitation, harassment, and abuses. So this webinar would basically highlight uh, the important steps that we need to take to ensure safe recruitment. It will also uh, highlight our experience as South Sudanese civil society in um, ensuring a safe recruitment and the challenges that we faced. Next. So there are mainly four stages in in the, in the process of the recruitment. And each of these stages has a set of things that we ensure to make sure that we recruit the right persons. But step number one in advertising, selection and interviewing, offers and onboarding as a last process. 
So we would see on what are the steps that we need to take in order to ensure safe recruitment in these uh, four stages. <clears throat> Next. The first stage is really the advertising. So when you are advertising for jobs, it's important that whereas you express your interest on the type of the persons and the qualifications you need, it's also important as an organization or employer for you to clearly express and highlight your organization values and commitment to safeguarding. This is important to inform potential applicants for the job that the organization hold a certain set of values and clearly and strongly abide by safeguarding and therefore they will be required to do so. What is also important is that even at the stage of the advertisement, you can already ask that applicants will carefully be scrutinized, including checking on their criminal record and ask them to disclose that on any behavior that they previously have in their previous works. So this is important already to show to the potential applicants that there are standards and the thorough recruitment process that would ensure a rigorous uh, assessment on their behaviors, previous actions related to safeguarding or sexual exploitation, abuses and harassment. So this in a way informs potential applicants to first decide whether or not they would like to apply for this job or whether or not they are willing to thoroughly be scrutinized. So next. <clears throat> Step number two is in the terms of the offer. It's important that organizations develop a clear shortlist criteria that highlights safeguarding uh, scores and have at least two uh, persons to shortlist each applicant using the criteria. So in terms of the criteria for organizations, my experience before we started developing our safeguarding policies in South Sudan Law Society is that organizations often, both South Sudan Law Society and our partner organizations, uh, where I am also involved in supporting recruitment of their staff, only focus on developing criteria for determining qualifications in terms of academic um, expertise and experience, but they do not put in terms of the criteria considerations around previous behavior or safeguarding standards. So in terms of the offers for safe recruitment, it's important that you now balance both the need for educational expertise, but also safeguarding standards as part of the criteria for, uh, for the offer. So this needs to be developed as well uh, to ensure that consistent interview structures with a rigorous set of questions are developed focusing on attitude, experience, and conduct pertaining to safeguarding. In essence, it's important that we combine both the need for ethics for safeguarding and the requisite knowledge and expertise we need to deliver on the job expertise. Next. <clears throat> So on, in terms of the onboarding, once uh, <coughs> applicants have applied, you are faced with the challenges considering conduct an accurate recruitment record uh, check. You need to see the record of the applicants in terms of their criminal record, what are their previous experience and history about safeguarding, about sexual exploitation, abuses and harassment. And uh, you would also request for referees from uh, previous employers of the applicants that you consider a potential for the job. And, uh, and then you would need to be able to cross check with this. Now, our challenge as organizations in really doing the cross checking is that first of all, in most countries in, South, in Africa, that we do not have a criminal records that are easily accessible. Our criminal records are still in analog form. They are not digitalized. So it's not possible for you to get on into those records. And uh, secondly, even if you would in other countries that have criminal records, it only contain records of crimes that are already registered and actually prosecuted. So in most cases, safeguarding issues would happen in a context of organization and they are not reported to the public criminal record system. So you would still have a challenge.
Hello, Gaspar. Gaspar? Sorry for the internet disconnection. Caroline, I hope you can hear me back. Yes, I can hear you. Great. So I was saying once you're able to gather the necessary information to inform on the previous history of the potential applicants that you need to consider uh, for the job, then you can compare them carefully in terms of the the references that are provided for you. And when you're asking for references, it's important that you clearly uh, provide a detailed set of questions around that person's previous experience and history related to safeguarding, what is specific conduct was there, what was that person's attitude. And that is very important sort of questions that you'd be asking. And often uh, the experience, again, I see with the organization that we have more questions on expertise and work So we seem to have lost Gasper again. So maybe we can continue from here. Um, from he, he was still talking about the criminal record. But we'll go to the next point on using original and official verifiable documents. And that when you're, when you're onboarding people, you might want to have the original documents because some of these are uh, photocopied documents can, can actually be be forged so you might want to have the original documents to support you in the onboarding and then on the issue of the of the references you have to request and review references from for the applicants you shortlist because you have to conduct some rigorous assessments as you do your reference checks because you understand sometimes people um, put those people that will not actually say anything bad about them so as you're doing your reference checks you must be very careful and you must be very rigorous. And you also have to check for gaps in uh, comparing between the applicant's CV information and all the information that's provided by the referees so that you see where the inconsistencies and that is where you can be able to question. So we go to the next slide. I can see Gaspar is back. You continue from the next slide. Next slide, Noel. So that's why you can continue from here. Uh, Caroline, sorry, and I think we've lost Gasper. Just to jump in and say that it seems that uh, the participants can't hear us. Gaspar is back. So you can continue, Gaspar. Some are here. Can you hear us? Because the, the chat is a, is a mix. Some can hear, some cannot hear. Yes, they can hear. So Gaspar can continue. Oh, he's frozen again. So we'll go to the challenges, challenges in ensuring safe, safe recruitment. First, most of the organizations don't have clear policies or detailed safeguarding, uh, safe recruitment checklist. So there is nothing that they are working uh, in consistency with because they, some, some of these things just happen randomly and all that. So there is need to be something clear to be followed for us to have uh, safe recruitment within organizations. Then do you find that there is very inadequate or very limited understanding of the policies around uh, recruiting staff. So as much as some, some few organizations might have these policies in place, it's, there is no knowledge or very limited knowledge around these policies. 
So if, um, the, the people actually concerned with recruiting might not be aware or they have some very small knowledge about what should be done to be able to have a safe recruitment. Then with the context in our country, we obviously know that it's not easy to access criminal records. So that also is an issue because someone can, ha can, can be a criminal somewhere in, in a different state or in a different location and they come to a different location and still manage to get a job despite them having that criminal record. So you find that it's really not easy to have accessible records to be able to help uh, organizations in ensuring safe recruitment. And then also there is this uh, reluctance from previous employers to share data on their previous employees, especially data on abuse. So some of these employers actually cover up for these employees because they will say, after all, this person is no longer working with me in, in this organization. So as much as you want them to give you information about the conduct of their, of their previous employees, they will be so reluctant or they will be so hesitant or they'll actually not even give you audience to be able to provide um, data on, on these employees. Then we also, with the context in the country, we don't have um, flexible legal frameworks or up to now we don't have anything apart from the labor law and the penal code. We don't have something specific on sexual exploitation that can be able to, to pin down uh, some of these people. So next slide, I think this is the end. Uh, so in conclusion, we can say that self-recruitment can only be realized through development of organizational safeguarding policies, uh, self-recruitment checklists, and empowering people in places to, to place safeguarding mechanisms with knowledge and to have commitment and to also uphold the safeguarding policies and standards for self-recruitment and people management. So from here, we'll go to the next presenter, who is Inez. Uh, we have Inez Kisiazik, who is working with the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response and coordinating the Interagency Misconduct Disclosure Scheme, which aims to improve recruitment practices and limit the movement of perpetrators of SIA between organizations. Inez is actively involved in promoting safe recruitment practices and is, advocated, is, and is advocating for more robust knowledge exchange within the humanitarian and development sector. Before joining the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response, Inez supported various initiatives such as the work of the Independent Commission on Sexual Misconduct, Accountability and Culture Exchange at Oxfam. Inez, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you can hear me loud and clear. Please uh, type in the chat box if you can't hear. Uh, many thanks to the uh, Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub for inviting me here today to present the Misconduct Disclosure Scheme. And many thanks to my co-panelist, Gasper, and for Caroline <laughs> to covering part of his uh, presentation for introducing uh, this important topic to us today so well and for flagging some important issues. So what I will do in my presentation, I will present the misconduct disclosure scheme. Uh, I will explain how it works and show you how it works in uh, practice and how it was performing in the last years. And then we will have some time to answer any questions and answers uh, you might have. So let me start by introducing the scheme. So the misconduct disclosure scheme has been launched in 2019 and it was initially implemented by 14 organizations. Right now it's implemented by more than 100. So as you can see in uh, about three years, we've managed to attract quite a lot of organizations who believe that protecting their staff and community members from uh, abusers or who committed some sexual misconduct is very important. The scheme, as uh, said by Caroline in the introduction, is facilitated by the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response. This is a group of NGOs, such as, say, the Children, Oxfam, CARE and others, who came together to look into this issue and propose a tool which can help us addressing the issue of perpetrators of sexual misconduct. And I would like to emphasize here that the misconduct disclosure scheme is looking at sexual misconduct only. 
So the steering committee for humanitarian response, uh, we're looking at developing a tool which could be used by all type of organizations to strengthen the referencing checks, which we are doing, and to propose something that can be easily adapted and used in our organizations. Uh, so what the scheme does, it builds on the processes which you already uh, have in place in your organization. It uses the existing resources, your HR team or referencing team, if you have one, and it provides you with a set of questions to request information related to sexual misconduct. It's very important to mention here that the misconduct disclosure scheme is complementary to other checks which Casper mentioned uh, in his presentation, such as criminal checks. Uh, and it's very important to remember that the misconduct disclosure scheme is not replacing those checks. It's adding an additional layer of security. And of course, most importantly, this is not a substitute for everything else you are doing to prevent sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment happening in your organization. Uh, there are two commitments uh, which all organizations signing up to the scheme are making. The first commitment is to uh, make sure that every time when you are running a recruitment, you are checking the references of your new potential staff member using the set of questions, which you will see in a second, which help you request information specifically related to sexual misconduct. And the other commitment is to make sure that every time when other organization is asking you for such information and you have something to disclose, you will disclose it. And what you get uh, in turn, you get more information about your upcoming staff members so that you can make sure that you know whom you are hiring and that you are not uh, unknowingly hiring someone who've committed sexual exploitation, abuse or harassment. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as I prom promised uh, just a second ago, this is the set of questions which we are asking all our members to use to request information related to sexual misconduct, which might have been committed by your upcoming staff members. So as you can see on this screen, this uh, is formatted in a very similar way to your usual reference checks forms. This was developed like that on purpose, because this way you can just copy those questions from this form, paste them into your existing reference check form, and ask your HR team to just use a slightly longer uh, form. And we've developed the scheme like that, so just to make sure that this is easy to to be adapted as part of what you already have in place because we realize that there are some processes which we can build on. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now let me show you what was the impact of the scheme in the 2019 and 2020. We will have this information for 2021 uh, in January next year. Uh, so for now, I can share with you only this. So you can see on this screen how many checks have been done by our members. Uh, so this is the middle column. So you can see that across uh, 2019 and 2020, organizations use the misconduct disclosure scheme more than 10,000 times. You can see that the response rate is quite good. It's slightly lower than the number of requests, but that's usual when you are doing referencing checks. Sometimes you unfortunately just don't hear back. Uh, but more importantly, all those checks conducted by our members led to 75 applications rejected at the final stage of recruitment because the candidate had uh, committed sexual misconduct and it was, it was all saved on their files. So our members we, uh, were able to find out that someone committed sexual misconduct when doing uh, referencing, thanks to the fact that they've used the scheme and asked all those questions. Uh, next slide, please. So let me go back to the more theoretical side and talk a little bit more about why do we need the scheme. So first of all, there is a strong anecdotal evidence that individuals who have committed sexual misconduct are still being hired. And I'm sure we all here in this webinar heard such stories or know about such situations. Uh, in addition to that, as I said at the beginning, the scheme is complementary to other checks, such as police checks, 
because sexual misconduct is not always investigated by police. Very often, I would even say more frequently, this is uh, investigated by your organization. So this is not something that can be detected in the criminal checks. And at times, the outcomes of investigations are not, uh, are not reported to the police. So again, this is not something you will be able to pick up as part of the criminal check. And then in addition to that, there is still some reluctance when it comes to sharing information related to sexual misconduct. Next slide, please. And I will show you how the misconduct disclosure scheme is trying to address that. Uh, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. But before I do that, uh, let me very briefly touch on the risk. So uh, the risk of implementing the misconduct disclosure scheme seems to be very visible and there is quite a lot of uneasiness about running additional checks. So as you can see on this slide, making those checks may lead to some legal exposure, may lead to some small financial risk, uh, for example, if you are sued for defamation, although uh, we have no complaints and no lawsuits uh, up to the date. And this is uh, an incorrect perception because if someone would like to sue you because they are unhappy with the investigation you've conducted, they would probably sue you before you do the references for them and not after you disclose this information. And then there is a risk of wrongly blacklisting an individual, which is raised with me quite frequently. Uh, so I think that this is all valid and the scheme is looking into answering all of this and I will talk about this in a second. But I would like to stop here briefly and just talk about the less visible risk of not checking references and not making all those checks. So uh, it was proven that people who commit sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment usually carry on perpetuating abuse in their new roles. So by hiring abuser of uh, sexual misconduct, we risk putting our community members and staff at risk of further abuse. Of course, uh, all organizations who hire such uh, individual who committed some sexual misconduct are put at huge reputational and financial risk. We've all heard about the NGO scandals and uh, usually the donor's response to such scandals is to stop the funding. And of course, uh, the financial loss related to that is huge. So I just wanted to flag it before I move on to make sure that we understand that why implementing a new initiative and strengthening our practices may raise some questions. It's really important for us to work together and see how we can move this forward because it's needed and we really need to protect our staff or our community members we work with and just make sure that all survivors of sexual misconduct who uh, reported and supported the investigation are being supported and that the outcomes of the investigations are being shared. Next slide, please. And just to very briefly describe how the scheme is uh, addressing the reluctance when it comes to sharing the data. And just to emphasize here that sharing the data related to sexual misconduct can be done both in practice uh, using your existing res resources. The scheme is free of charge. Uh, you don't need much to prepare to implement it. And it also can be done in line with the uh, legal requirements, be it the uh, national labor law or data protection regulations. So what the scheme is trying to do, uh, back in 2019, we had 14 organizations who've been piloting this initiative. They signed up to the scheme and started sharing data on sexual misconduct. This resulted in better hiring decision and reduced the number of abusers being hired. You could see uh, before in my presentations that the scheme uh, managed to stop 75 applications coming from uh, abusers. And this helped us build a strong legal and practical case and prove that this is something that can be done quite easily, that adding those, uh, those questions, which we call statement of conduct, is not that different from the reference checks we are doing right now and it gives you something really useful when it comes to requesting those information and this helped us build confidence that this is something that can be done in practice and that it can be done legally 
And that's why the scheme has been growing quite rapidly and we are still accepting new members. And I think it's really worth considering for all of you present here today, if your organization would, would like to sign up. This is free of charge and provides you a support in making sure that you know whom you are hiring. I will stop here. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much to my co-panelists and Safeguarding Resources and Support Hub. Caroline, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Inez and Gaspar. We have a couple of questions uh, that you will need your attention. I'll start off with Gaspar. The first question is that you mentioned that many incidents are not reported. So how, in the face of these challenges, how is it that it is possible to obtain criminal records and in what ways do you obtain information about applicants' safeguarding records? Okay, thank you, Caroline. On that question, I was expressing the fact that when we look at the criminal record, that's the public record for crimes that is committed. And some of the organization and they are not repeat, reported to public uh, law enforcement authorities. So the way to get that information requires that you again cross check with the previous employers so that you get that information that, about the behavior of those applicants, even for conduct that was not reported to public law enforcement agents like the police. So you'd have a limited uh, data or information on public uh, criminal record but you need to reinforce that information with more uh, background check with previous employers of the potential applicant for the job. So then someone was following up and asking that would it be possible to, to have some examples at least of specific questions that you would want to include in reference checks and whether there is any specific shortlisting criteria to be used. Yes, Ines, that's that's. To yes, you. I would actually say that at the end of that, the example of the. Yes. Okay. It's okay, Gaspar. Ines will come after. Is, is that to me? It's to both of you, I guess, because there's no name that was mentioned. Gaspar, feel free to kick off, and then I will compliment. All right. Yes. I would actually say a complete list of those examples of questions that we have been using. But first is to assess whether or not the previous job involves that person relating with vulnerable persons, for example, children, uh, women, or any uh, a position that is likely to enable that person compromise on behavior and lead to sexual exploitation, harassment, and, and abuses. So once that is, you find a yes answers in that question, then you can go to specific questions on uh, what has that person done? What was, was he involved in a safeguarding issues related to children or women previously? So you would an explanation. And if you're given an explanation that is not satisfactory, you might need to ask a follow-up questions. So I will say a list of the sample questions for the uh, uh, checklist uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay. So Inez, as you answer that, you might also want to answer a question on what are the mechanisms that are put in place to collect data on misconduct based on the past and present. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So first of all, actually the misconduct disclosure scheme, which I've just presented, is basically a set of questions which you can use to, uh, to include in reference check and requesting in this information. So I will put a link to the set of questions in the chat box so you can look at this uh, offline. And then the second question, sorry, Caroline, I forgot the question. The question I was asking is what mechanisms can be put in place to collect data on misconduct? Yeah, so, I mean, this really builds on uh, your general approach your organization is having to prevention of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. So I'm assuming that you have some policies already. So it's good practice to just check what you already have and then see, for example, which team is looking at collating the 
uh, data and then what they are already asking for. Because the misconduct disclosure scheme, for example, is only asking you about uh, anonymized data, which is shared with a broader audience. But for your own purposes inside the organizations, you will need to collate more information because you will need to make sure that you are learning on your experiences and also using the findings of your current investigations, current data you have when it comes to sexual misconduct. Uh, to inform your policies and everything really that you are doing when it comes to prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. And just to mention uh, here that if you are interested in uh, an example, a template database of information related to sexual uh, misconduct, UN is having something like that, which is publicly available on their website. So you can look at this uh, and use it as a template to build on it. Okay, so someone is saying that in spite of organizations having strong safeguarding policies and safe recruitment still happens. So they are of the opinion that beyond the recruitment policies, organizations should look into how abusers can be identified before entry into work with the vulnerable communities. So uh, that means that character profiling and personality-based tests can be encouraged during the recruitment. So the question here would be, is how do you do the character profiling to ensure that the ones that have bad characters do not get into, uh, into these places? Then to Ines, someone is also asking, is the data of sexual misconduct being segregated by sex of the abusers or how do you do it? And also how can an organization sign up for the scheme? So for instance, what are the procedures to follow? Yes, Inez, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me start with the first question about the fact that even if we have policies uh, in place and they are strong and quite well on working quite well on the paper, not always uh, are they working in practice. So yes, this happens a lot and this is a very good question and I think this really is about looking at our internal culture when it comes to PSEH and making sure that this is a priority for all of us and that this is something that we all treat uh, like a priority basically and we do that at all times because it's very important. It's also a good uh, practice to make sure that HR has support they need and they understand why doing, for example, referencing checks is so important and that they are uh, faults, for example, if they decide not to check references properly or they are uh, too busy with something else can lead to a really serious outcomes. So I think very often there is no understanding of the fact that we all have some power when it comes to impacting our wider organization. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, a very good point about uh, identifying abusers before they come into the sector, although that's uh, easier said than done, I have to say. I've uh, conducted a number of recruitments, uh, including uh, humanitarian deployments, and I would say that sometimes it's very tricky to just, you know, based on some written tests or a couple of hours with uh, a new person which you don't really know to make sure that this is not an abuser. And that's why it's very important to put all those parts together. And Gasper was covering this in his uh, presentation. It's very important to do proper, proper interview, make sure that you have some safeguarding questions. It's very important to make sure that this is backed up by a proper reference checks and that includes criminal records if possible, because only if you have all those information, you can make sure that you've done everything you could do uh, to make sure that this person is sharing the values of your organization. And I would say that it's good practice to actually do some basic Googling or check LinkedIn profiles or just check online what is this person posting uh, on LinkedIn or such uh, professional platforms to just uh, get more information. And then you, if you think that there is a red flag or you are not clear, it's always good practice to follow up with that person uh, during the interview, for example. And then there was another question about uh, perpetrator's data and if this is 
segregated by sex. So for the misconduct disclosure scheme, this is not uh, segregated. Uh, but I think there is quite a lot of research uh, available online, and uh, it seems like usually the majority of perpetrators uh, are men, but of course not all of them, and some uh, sexual exploitation, abuse or harassment is also perpetuated by women, so I wouldn't uh, like to tell anyone that it's always safe to recruit female. While we do need more female staff, please make sure that you are running proper reference checks for all your staff. This is very important. Uh, and then the last question was about signing up to the scheme. Uh, so uh, this is very easy and uh, you will receive the, um, the PowerPoint after this call, I believe. So I can include some information about how to sign up to the scheme. You can also check uh, our website and there is more information and in my email address. I will put that in the chat box in a second as well. Uh, all we need for a, an organization to sign up is an email from the CEO or head of your organization to confirm that you are committed to implementing the scheme and then I will get in touch with you or your HR colleagues uh, to prepare you for implementation and make sure that everything is in place. I will stop here. Caroline and Gasper, uh, you probably would like to add something. Thank you. Maybe I just want to weigh in, in the, to the question related to a situation where much as we have the policies and a, a safe recruitment checklist, still we sometimes end up recruiting uh, wrong persons. And I would like to say, yes, that still happened because the policies and the checklist is only effective to the level that we are able to get information about the previous behavior of that potential applicant. And where you are unable to get the data, you will still get up recruiting, end up recruiting somebody who could be bad, but you didn't get the data about it. And really the limitation about getting the, the data is the challenge. And I would encourage that in terms of protecting with the previous record, I, you can also do some sort of informal uh, uh, check if you can able, be able to do that and later substantiate that information uh, officially for you to be able to know. There are people you'd be able to know through their Facebook like you have rightly, uh, my colleague, the finalist has rightly recommended. But in a context in, in societies like Africa, you can also know them in the society. So you'd be able to do a, a informal check on their behavior and the previous experience in work. And then you would use the formal processes through those offices to substantiate that information. And to me, the other layer of protection against possible recruitment of persons who have bad behavior on board is that you need to ensure that the probation period of the contract is really followed by a very uh, close monitoring on the behavior of that employee. You would recommend that the employment contract have a, a short probation period, and that probation period gives an opportunity to that employee to interact with vulnerable people under close supervision for us to see the behavior and the monitor actually how that person plays out in the real uh, workplace. And of course, the probation provides a ground for firing that person. Should we identify that there is a potential behavior against uh, uh, sexual exploitation, harassment, and abuses? So the other safeguard at the end of the contract is really important that you have those probation period. I would advise against giving a long contract immediately a power because that becomes difficult for you even to terminate contracts in the process. Thank you. <clears throat> So thank you so much. There is a question on uh, the statistics that is it possible to know the results of the 2020 statistics as in the types of organizations, be it local, national, or international, that submitted answers to the survey or to that inquiry and whether there were rejected candidates uh, who engaged in suing those organizations. I think that's to Inez again. And then there is also, this is to gasp, I think, uh, that they, we've had cases where safeguarding happens. It is reported by the host organization, instead of taking action against the perpetrator, they just transfer the perpetrator to another country or location. How can such cases be solved? Uh, another one is asking, 
since, since some of the criminal cases are not captured in the system, and sometimes the reference check miss out those safeguarding information, what other steps should be taken? And lastly, what's your view about doing checks on digital platforms, for instance, social media? Thank you. So, any of you can start, I don't know, enable Gasper starting off. Gasper, would you like to start? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I would like to say that in the first place, the first question is a situation where the host organization is not willing to deal with uh, uh, sexual exploitation, harassment, abuse and harassment cases in a way that is supposed to be handled. And to me, there is a level where it gets outside an organization. Once the host organization is unable or not, not willing to manage the case according to a standard of safeguarding, it becomes a crime. And the organization to be able to tell to the other world outside the ocean and no uh, actions are being actors to act on that. In terms of the external activation, we have NGO forums. In terms beyond the NGO forums, we already have laws that are not addressed by the host organization. So that is to address the issues. But to me, what is organization? Otherwise, the outsider world won't if it's not reported to the outsider world. So the second question is related to where they are a set of questions that might have been missed out in the process of doing the Tara assessment. And I think this is pretty much the same as the previous question that we have answered related to situations where besides doing the uh, uh, safe recruitment standards and procedures, you still end up recruiting uh, persons who have a previous bad record. And to me, any information that comes after the recruitment is still valid for us to inform the employer with regard to whether terminating the contract or not. For example, you have already recruited the person and after some time, so one month or so, you, you, hear, you hear another additional information that actually you did not get during the process of the recruitment that that person is involved in a sexual exploitation and harassment and abuse. And that information is still valid for you to consider terminating the contract, but also sharing that information with other organizations. If you have the sort of the hub that the, uh, uh, Annette, has, has, Annette has talked about, it's very important also for us as organizations to share that information, even if we still don't have the protocol for sharing information. It's important that we as organizations take the responsibility and already share with our organizations. And most of these days, organizations actually already work in networks. So it's important that if you have an issue with an employee to the extent of terminating that contract, you always share with your partners. That is very important, especially for civil society organizations. With the UN agencies, I think they already have those systems in place. The main challenge is really with the civil society organizations, and that really Really, this recommendation goes to them that let's start sharing even before establishing the protocols and mechanisms for sharing. So what I would encourage is that you keep that sharing confidential and useful for your organization in the recruitment process until you have a clear protocol and the standards in place that complies with the legal framework for sharing a data related to uh, misconduct. Thank you, Gaspar. Inez, you might want to have like uh, the four minutes to wrap up, to answer and wrap up, thank you. Yeah, sure, I will be really quick then. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so for the first question, which was asking about the type of organizations who've uh, been implementing the scheme in 2020, uh, so uh, I should probably very briefly mention here that initially the scheme has been open for NGOs only, but there was lots of interest from private sector, from UN agencies and from donors 
So the scheme is implemented by all types of organizations. So those are large international NGOs, smaller local NGOs. Uh, those are UN agencies. Right now, UNHCR started implementing the scheme. Uh, our first donor is on the way and private sector organizations who uh, work in humanitarian or development are also implementing the scheme. So this data comes from a mix of organizations. Then when it comes to the criminal uh, checks and reference checks which failed, Gasper answered that very well. But it's really key to make sure that you have uh, you are asking all your new staff members to sign the self-declaration form. Just uh, this gives you something which you can use if you need to terminate the contact, the contract. Uh, this is a really easy tool and this gives you something to fall back uh, if you have to. Uh, and then for the checks of uh, social media, I would say definitely check LinkedIn and do some basic Google check if you can do that. Uh, just to make sure, and you can then ask the candidate if you find something. And when it comes to uh, <clears throat> sharing information about uh, abusers, the misconduct disclosure scheme is here to facilitate there. I put my email address in the chat box, so feel free to contact me as we are running out of time. And I will hand back over to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. That's what would you want to take one minute to wrap up? Yes, so I would just want to say that uh, uh, safe recruitment really is dependent on a very detailed policy in place, but also committed staff who are trained to conduct the assessment themselves. And then thirdly is on the question about obtaining data necessary for you to be able to verify with potential uh, applicants for the job. So that getting that data is challenged in most of the countries, but I would encourage that uh, close cooperation with partners and organization that you work with are very important because you will need to have a more informal text uh, references uh, than just the formal one that you send a, a, a template, the person fills it and sends you back. You need to take a more uh, additional step to verify that information both formally and informally in order to ensure that the recruitment is in place and always end up with a protection contract that has a short term with the close supervision of the, uh, of the new recruit for you to ensure that you uh, confirm if the behavior is safe by an app organization. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspar and Ines, and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. You'll be sure, uh, sure for me to send all your, uh, to you all the presentations, both Gaspar's and Ines' presentation, plus the questions and answers. You will have, uh, I will type them up so that you get them clearly. I know sometimes there have been disruptions. So we are going to have you get all the presentations and the question and uh, answers. So for the meantime, before you all log out, just one minute to do this evaluation because it will help us in our future webinars. For the rest of us, we can. there is, there is an evaluation on, on your screen if you see right now. So it will be helpful to fill it in. I've seen someone is still typing, asking for the slides. Yes, all this will be shared with you after us compiling and having all the, uh, the questions and answers incorporated into the uh, presentation. Once again, thank you to everyone and hope to see you next time for our next webinar. Thank you, Caroline, for having us. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much, Caroline and Noel, for your support.